Happy New Year to you all, and welcome to the Akron Roundtable. I'm Stephen Schmidt, President of the Akron Roundtable Board of Directors for 2016, and your luncheon host. On behalf of the board, we appreciate each of you taking the time to attend today's program. We are delighted to be at the Knight Center in downtown Akron today, and to welcome Akron's first newly elected mayor in nearly three decades, Mayor Dan Horrigan, as today's luncheon speaker. 2016 is Akron Roundtable's 40th anniversary year of bringing the world to Akron. Since 1976, the Akron Roundtable has been a gathering place for civic-minded people from all walks of life and an invaluable opportunity for the audience to gain new insights from world-class speakers. Once again, thank you for being here today for the first roundtable in this 40th anniversary year and in joining us in continuing this Akron tradition. The Akron Roundtable is grateful for the community support it receives from individuals, companies, and foundations. It is their investment in Akron Roundtable which has allowed us to bring the world to Akron for 40 years. In honor of Akron Roundtable's 40th anniversary, I'd like to recognize the Cleveland Clinic Akron General as a title sponsor of the Akron Roundtable for 2016. In addition, First Energy Foundation and State and Federal Communications are both presenting sponsors for the year. Today's luncheon sponsor is the law firm Browse McDowell. Sponsorship opportunities remain available in honor of Roundtable's 40th anniversary and in support of our luncheons. And I invite you to visit akronroundtable.org for more information on sponsorship. Additionally, we would like to recognize the Akron Beacon Journal, the Kiwanis Club of Akron, and the Greater Akron Chamber for being legacy sponsors of Akron Roundtable. Akron Roundtable also receives financial support from local underwriters to host a number of high school students at our luncheons. I'd like to have those students who are here today stand and be recognized and for us to give them and their sponsors a round of applause. If the students would please stand. Please warmly welcome the students to Akron Roundtable. In addition, we have a great group of community-minded individuals who serve on the board of directors for Akron Roundtable. At this time, I invite the board members to stand and be recognized. Should you have any questions or suggestions about Akron Roundtable, please feel free to speak to any member of the board. Please join me in recognizing members of the Board of Directors of Akron Roundtable. <laughs> the brochures that are at your table include a listing of many organizations and individuals who support the Akron Roundtable. Complete information on all Roundtable programs can also be obtained by visiting our website, akronroundtable.org. We have a great lineup of speakers for 2016 to celebrate Akron Roundtable's 40th anniversary, and I hope all 690 of you come back to each and every one of our programs this year. Today's presentation will be broadcast on WKSU 89.7 FM on Thursday, February the 4th at 8 p.m. and is sponsored by Cascade Audi. During today's luncheon, the Akron Roundtable will utilize Quayo technology, which is a mobile phone technology that enables audience members to submit questions for our speaker via their mobile devices. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation and will be posed to our speaker later in the program. Simple instructions for using the Quayo technology are provided in the brochures at your table. Cards are also available on your tables to submit questions in, to the speaker in the traditional or old-fashioned way. At this time, I invite Stephanie York, president of the Qantas Club of Akron, to begin our luncheon with today's invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Stephanie? Top 10. 
10 New Year's resolutions. 10, spend more time with family. Nine, drink less. Eight, volunteer. Seven, quit smoking. Six, learn something new. Five, start exercising. Four, travel to new places. Three, spend less. Two, get organized. And one, lose weight. How many people are successful in achieving their resolution? Eight percent. So to start out this new year and to help out our new city leader, Mayor Dan Horrigan, I ask that we all stop making resolutions that are full of good intentions, but last only a short time. I am challenge you to forego the momentary midnight wish wishfulness and instead act with purpose every day to make our community a better place. We know it's not enough to have good intentions, but together we can be a source of encouragement to one another. Let us strive to be intentionally kind even when we feel cruel. Be intentionally inclusive, even if it makes people uncomfortable. Be intentionally helpful, even when it's not so convenient. Be intentionally charitable, even if you are in need yourself. And be intentionally patient, even when you are frustrated. By acting intentionally every day, we can make our lives and our community better. In previous months, you have heard me recite Jewish and Buddhist prayers. Today, I think it's most appropriate for me to deliver a Catholic prayer that is said when a new government leader takes office. God of power and might, wisdom and justice, through you, authority is rightly administered. Laws are enacted and judgment is decreed. Assist with your spiritual spirit of counsel and fortitude, the mayor, city of Akron, his cabinet, and members of council. May they always seek the ways of righteousness justice and mercy, and grant that they may be enabled by your power, powerful protection to lead our city with honesty and integrity. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. We will begin our program promptly at 12.20. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Akron Roundtable. I am Stephen Schmidt, President of the Akron Roundtable Board of Directors. The Roundtable is brought to you today over radio station WKSU 89.7 FM from the Knight Center in downtown Akron, Ohio. The radio broadcast is underwritten by Cascade Out. Today's luncheon program is generously sponsored by Browse McDowell Law Firm. Additionally, we would like to recognize the Akron Beacon Journal, the Kiwanis Club of Akron, and the Greater Akron Chamber for being legacy sponsors. The Cleveland Clinic Akron General is a title sponsor for this 40th anniversary year of Akron Roundtable. First Energy Foundation and State and Federal Communications are presenting sponsors for 2016. Please mark your calendars now for our next roundtable, scheduled on Thursday, February the 18th, 2016, when the Akron Roundtable will host LPGA Pro and Educator Renee Powell from East Canton. To make a reservation for any of the Roundtable's luncheons or to purchase a subscription to our luncheon series, please visit our website at akronroundtable.org. Today, the Akron Roundtable is pleased to host Dan Horrigan, Mayor of the City of Akron, Ohio, whose presentation is entitled Innovate, Collaborate, and Grow, A New Day for Akron. I will now ask former Akron Roundtable board member and president and CEO of State and Federal Communications, Elizabeth Bartz, to introduce our presenter. Thank you for the opportunity to do today's introduction. I'm very ecstatic to see today's Akron Roundtable community. Mayor, I believe it's true. If you build it, they will come. 
or maybe it's Sally Field. They love you, they love you. Either way, my name is Elizabeth Bartz, President and CEO of State and Federal Communications, a great American company in a great American city. Just last week, I saw Mayor Horgan at the U.S. Conference of Mayors Winter Meeting in D.C. I'm a huge proponent of professional development and, so, and appreciated him surrounding himself with mayors from other cities, larger and smaller, um, because it's a great way to see how other mayors are dealing with the trends that they are facing around the country. So the question is, who is Dan Horgan? Well, he became our 62nd mayor on January 1st of this year. I overslept her now, I'm just saying. Dan began his professional career as a teacher. He had his undergraduate degree in economics at Kent State University, and then attended the University of Akron to receive a second degree in education. See, he's already learning to work between the lines. I think that's great. While in school, he worked as a teamster and as a curb boy at Swenson's. That's what I'm really into. Dan taught social studies at St. Vincent St. Mary High School. Oh, I heard it. Oh, yeah. um, but later at Stone and Grove Falls High School, Dan founded the successful AP, Advanced Placement Program in Economics, which is still used today. He won election to Akron's first ward council seat in 1999, which he held for eight years. In 2007, the Summit County Democratic Party selected him as clerk of court, where he served for eight years. Like this. It's a trend, Teresa Charm. He was elected president of the Ohio Clerk of Courts Association, and the Supreme Court approved, appointed Dan, excuse me, to serve on the commissions overseeing the funding of courts with the use of new technology. He and his lovely wife, Deanna, have three daughters and are raising a fourth generation of a Oregon family here in Akron's North Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming, in welcoming to the Akron Roundtable community, Mayor Dan Horgan. I, I think Sally Field said you really like me. I've used that before, too. I think Rick gave that one. Thank you. Before we get started, I, I want to make sure that we thank uh, Greg Mervis and the uh, Night Center staff for a, what a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful lunch. We can give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to thank the Akron Roundtable and tell you how proud and honored I am to be your first speaker in your 40-year anniversary. Um, and before I go any further, I remember um, Steve, my good friend Steve Schmidt, has said, hey, September, uh, September, he said, listen, if you end up winning, would you be the roundtable speaker in January? I said, yeah, it's just a couple hundred people. I think we kind of overshot a little bit, but uh, I'm proud to proud of the that we've been able to draw. Roundtable is an Akron institution that serves as a model about, about what is best for our community. In looking over the list of founders of this organization in 1976, I see names of men who fought in World War II and women who were part of the greatest generation. They passed the torch to the baby boomers, quite frankly, my generation, who have sustained these monthly gatherings through the 1980s and 90s. Now, the leadership of the roundtable includes young professionals who will see it continue well into the 21st century. There have been changes along the way. You can send your questions today to the podium via your mobile device. And for those, most of you that are old enough to remember, I know we were all our mobile devices for our parents. I remember um, quite a few times. And speaking of my parents, my mom is here, and I told her I'm not going to get a chance to eat in typical mom fashion. She says, don't worry, I'll put together a plate for you. So <laughs> she made me come by for the Akron's round table's importance cannot be, uh, the importance of the community cannot be underestimated. And please join me in congratulating the volunteer board that continues to serve us today. applause and laughter things back here, so if I could cue to an applause, um, boom. Just as uh, Roundtable has changed and adapted to an ever evolving environment, so must all of Akron's institutions, and I've spoken about this over the coming months, uh, including its city government, and changes are coming up at us uh, faster than ever. And when I talk about a transformation of change, 
Um, I, I, and each one of us, in, in how the relationships are built, each one of us understand our role, and we need to understand our role. Uh, and I didn't run for the mayor's office to be a deciding vote somewhere. I ran for the mayor's office to be the lead vote on everything, and that's something that we continue to do every single day. That's an applause lap for two of us. What can keep us centered and, quite frankly, me, times of change, is an adherence to the traditions that have sustained us as a community. One such tradition is the strength of bringing together uh, leaders from multiple generations. Uh, the fabric of Akron is uh, literally stronger if we can weave together some of the wisdom of the past with the energy and enthusiasm of our young profession, just as Roundtable has done in the past 40 years. What can keep us comforted, I think, in times of rapid change is the support of family and friends. And truly, I'm blessed in that regard. Uh, I'm most fortunate to have my mom here today, my wife, Anna. My kids really were upset that they couldn't make it. Some of their friends actually did get to come here from another school. Uh, and, my, and truly, the real leader of our family is my wife, Anna, and I appreciate all the support throughout the years. So thank you. What can keep us focused, I think, in times of rapid change is having a team of talented individuals. Uh, and quite literally, I'm excited to go to work every single day. I know it's only 28 days, but I, I love going to work and working with these people every single day because they are committed to perform as servant leaders. And it's something that I've highlighted in the last, uh, during the election cycle and even past. It's a high priority for me. And I think the City Hall leadership team is as diverse a group of men and women uh, who bring an enormous strength and talent to helping leading the task of leading action in the future. If I can ask my cabinet to stand and please recognize. I appreciate all of your hard work every single day. <laughs> you wouldn't applaud for my wife if you applauded for cabinet. <laughs> I, I can't go any further, and I want to recognize another group of individuals who will help transform action. Uh, let me ask your members of Akron City Council to please stand for the round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to congratulate you, Council President Marilyn Keith. And on behalf of the City of Akron, uh, I'd like to thank Councilman Jeff Busco, who as Council President last year stepped into the mayor's position and quite frankly did a, did a fantastic job. Thank you, Jeff, very much. <laughs> In my inaugural speech on New Year's Day, I said our city is on the verge of a renaissance, and it's a time when we can create a strong and more stable neighborhoods, a vibrant place and a vibrant space, and an economy that is inclusive and will lift everyone up. And I asked a key question, and I ask myself this every day. I asked if we are simply comfortable to manage a population decline and its impact on our city. Are we prepared to make that commitment every single day that we believe that after is poised to innovate and grow? Uh, 28 days isn't a tremendous amount of history or a whole lot of history to base a roundtable speech, uh, especially when you're ending a city government that's been run away uh, for, 20, for 28 years, and there's been a lot of success stories over those 28 years. But I want you to know that on the day after the election, uh, we went from campaign mode to governing mode very quickly, like as in immediately. I remember the first speech I gave um, over at the Quaker Station to a minority business enterprise. So it, it, it's not like things stop. They keep, they, keep coming at you every single day, and that's what we try to do is be ready the day after the election. But immediately after that, I joined 22 newly elected mayors over three days at Harvard, and kind of segues to your point. Um, we, there's that peer learning. I mean, there's a lot of good ideas out there that happen in a lot of other cities, and I quite frankly, I told every single one of them that I'll, I'll steal every idea we can to help make this city better, because there are ideas out there, and they are being used. We want to make sure we use them in the partnership as much as possible. I quickly appointed a, a Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, to do what I promised to do this summer, and that was to look under the hood of city government. Uh, I have also asked Summit County's internal audit team to take a deep dive into Akron's finances and to work with my finance team, of Diane Miller Dawson and Steve Fricker. I know they're here somewhere, thank you. I know they're working <laughs> diligently. And we want to examine Akron's revenue sources and our expenses, every single one of them. We have to be, as, as a charge as an elected official, I and we have to be efficient with every single dollar we have. Um, I also want to look for every single resource or money uh, that can help support us. And there are a lot of business decisions that the city makes, and whether it's buying salt or purchasing cars or hiring outside professionals, 
we have to look at the logic behind every one of those decisions and make sure that we're efficient as possible. And I've been working diligently to ask uh, the key question, why do we do the things we do? And the answer that's always bugged me, and quite frankly, it should bug everybody, is because it's always done that way, is not an acceptable answer. It's not acceptable to me, and it's not going to be acceptable to my Catholic community. The task force made an initial recommendation to change the way, sorry, Akron manages its full-time employees, 1,800 full-time employees. And it was shocking to me to see a city our size, um, with such a large and diverse workforce, uh, not have a full-time personnel director. And I understand the decisions that went behind to kind of combine some of those, but we have employees that have worked in very important positions who were last assessed or in last defined in the last century. Quite frankly, that was 16 years ago. We are into the 21st century, and we need to move the city into the 21st century as quickly as we can. I have proposed, and with the support of Akron City Council, they agreed to ask the voters of Akron to accept a change in the city charter, to create a new Department of Human Resources. Because I think employees, and if you ask most businesses, employees are their, uh, their, they are their most important capital asset and how we retain, and how we retrain, and how we recruit employees is extremely important to our organization, just like it's important to businesses. Uh, it'll be out, it'll be on the ballot in March, and, and I urge all of you to support it. If it's passed, which I, I have a really strong feeling that it will, um, it'll allow us to keep the best characteristics of civil service that has protected Akron employees and their taxpayers for over 60 years. But at the same time, it gives us tools to manage a city in the 21st century when it comes to human resources. And believe me, it's marked by great technological changes, and we need to be able to adapt to those as quickly as possible. As the saying goes, and I don't want to be too cliche, you do, there's a lot of ideas that are good, but you do win with people. And I think a lot of people recognize that as that you do win with people. Another immediate issue for me was to understand, or better understand, the single largest construction project that's going on in, in the history of the city. And that's the billion dollar, and I use that word billion very sparingly, because you know, I, I, I don't want it to be a billion dollar project. I want it to be half of that. And that's one of the things that we're working on uh, to drive those costs down. Uh, we hope it's, uh, we have to continue to make it affordable to businesses and residents. And that's to correct Akron's combined sewer overflow um, system. And that construction project will take place over the next decade and quite possibly beyond. Immediately after the election. Um, I asked Service Director John Moore to make arrangements for me and a couple of us to meet with the US EPA in Washington. We met in, in uh, January 12th, uh, just this past, just a couple of weeks ago, to make sure that the EPA knew that this is a new administration in Akron, and that we wanted to work with them to renew Akron's water base because of its importance to the entire region. And we wanted to do it in the most efficient and affordable way possible. It's quite telling how much of an issue that became during the last three or four years. I'll also tell you that I personally reached out to the Federal District Court for Northern Ohio to make sure what often appeared to be a war with the federal government and the judges is now over. <laughs> Listen, the, the cause we're all pursuing is very noble. And literally to correct a problem that began in the 19th century when industrial growth expanded, uh, exploded through the African area. We can work together so that a future generation yet unborn will enjoy our river streams and our canal way that will have not been so clean since the first people arrived here in the uh, early 1800s. One of Akron's biggest assets is that we are a gateway to the only national park in Ohio. Our commitment to renewing those waterways recognizes that also because it is a regional asset that affects a lot of different people. There's, uh, I think, a misconception, I've highlighted this before, that Akron had to be forced by the federal government to um, correct the combined sewer overflow problem. Uh, but Akron has been working diligently for the last 30 years to find an acceptable and cost-effective way to fix that problem since 1987. The city has spent, and you use these terms you know, kind of sparingly, but um, the city has spent well over $390 million, and if you let that sink in, almost $400 million over a 30-year period to correct this problem. So our commitment remains very strong to be able to do it. It's just doing it in the most affordable and effective way possible. <laughs> and that includes upgrades to the Akron's water reclamation facility in the Cog Valley. That's why you can drive down the Bath Road starting in a couple days when the great blue herons arrive in early February. Uh, these herons are there for a reason. 
and there's food for their offspring in all the lakes and the marshes, and that's something that Akron has provided over the last 30 years, to be able to clean up those waterways so, those, um, so that can't occur in our national park. In December, the city received approval from the EPA um, for three projects as part of a integrated plan um, which uses green alternatives as opposed to gray alternatives to help alleviate some of those sanitary sewers from three different neighborhoods. Uh, the first one being Merriman Road in West Akron, Middlebury in East Akron, and on North Hill. Excuse me. This plan could reduce the number of storage tunnels. They had a proposal for two. We want to reduce that to one. Uh, it's now being built along the Towpath Trail and Muscle Store in downtown Akron. And here's the payoff. The integrated plan could save, and here's another one of those big numbers again, could save as much as $300 million off the program. And those are the things that we're looking for, and that was the commitment to work with them. Uh, if the EPA does accept our proposal, it stretches out the timeline from 2027 to 2040, and we can make those, uh, I think, the costs more affordable and much more palatable to all of our customers. Over the years, the city has invested millions of dollars to maintain our water utility. And it has been none so, it has not been as important as maybe the last couple of weeks. We are a very conscientious steward of our responsibility for our watershed in Geauga County. In recent years, we've partnered with companies uh, in Israel um, to ensure the safe uh, water supply for everybody, for Akron and the region. And that seems like pretty mundane material until you kind of realize what's been in the news. When we consider what has happened in Flint, Michigan, what has happened in Sebring, and what has happened to the Toledo water supply, I think, um, and in fact I know, when you look at what we've invested into the water facility and how safe and effective it is, I think it's something that we can all be proud of. Um, we're supplying most of the water needs for Akron and the metropolitan area, which is something that we take, I think, a, a lot of pride in, too. You can't just, in, in going through the last 28 days, you can't just swing at the pitches in your throat. You're going to get a curveball, you're going to get a, an easy one to hit. Uh, another initiative that's long been on the city's want list is that uh, had never really been able to get off the ground, I think, as much as people would have wanted. And that's to create a strategic plan for the development of Summit County's largest employment and entertainment district, and that's Downtown Akron. The president of Downtown Akron Partnership, Susie Graham, is working with my team in developing a process that will be inclusive, detailed, and quite frankly, quick. I don't want to wait around forever for a plan. We want to get it done in the next three to six months. And this is a plan for what is often being called the community's living room, is downtown Akron. It is one of our most important assets in attracting and retaining young talent. And that's never been so highlighted over the last six months is, you know, how are we going to attract and retain young talent? One new construction, one new project starts construction later this year. And we will begin the work of reshaping and repurposing the interbelt, commonly known as Route 59 through downtown Africa. And it will be our big day. And it holds for us great promise, I think, and I, I know a lot of people think the same thing, of economic development in that region. What's been missing from downtown and has been highlighted is housing. And we don't need to look to Cleveland a little bit north uh, to see how young professionals have flocked to downtown over the last 10 years. And it's something that we want to continue to try to do too. They want the experience of living in the urban center. And I've already had conversations with multiple developers who are committed to addressing just that fact. And there's a shortfall. We hope to make announcements about new, about new projects before the end, before the summer. Downtown should be and will be a thriving neighborhood and an economic center for the region. And it's a place where people of all ages and professionals can live and have the amenities necessary to do so. Can't just have housing without necessary, whether they be retail amenities, they can't be food deserts, as so aptly described by so many people. Downtown is a constantly evolving economy unto itself. Changes in the market are sometimes beyond the city and county's control. Consolidation has been a trend, and if you study just a little bit of economics, consolidation has been a trend in every industry for the past 20 years. It's impacted our planning, uh, whether in the 70s and 80s, we're talking about Akron's rubber giants merging into uh, other companies and being acquired or owners of Akron's healthcare providers. This week's news is another example of our ability and our need to be agile in responding to change. Some people have been aware that for some time our last home-owned banking institution could be a candidate for acquisition. And news came Monday night after the stock market closed that First Merit would merge into Huntington Bank, which already has a presence in downtown Akron. Like the Firestone Bank, Goodyear Bank, Centran Bank, which I I remember I had an account in a long time ago. 
Um, first, more, first parent will now become part of a larger corporation governed outside the city. I'm thankful that it's at least a, a city inside of Ohio that's only two hours away, uh, but it's also part of a continuing economic trend that's been going on in a lot of industries. What's important is that we join with the new owners in helping them retain as many jobs or more possible here. We've had early meetings with Huntington and First Merit, and the commitment remains strong because First Merit is an institution, and we like that presence in First Downtown. In, we like First Merit's presence in downtown to be maintained also. They've been a strong community partner for us, and we need Huntington to be able to do so also. These trends in the business community also mean that we, as a government, have to change also. We have to transform city government to match the transformation that we're seeing in the rest of our economy. And I've highlighted a couple of those things before. Inside City Hall and all of its departments, I want to see, and I have seen progress, in a change of culture. Proof every single day by every single employee. And first and foremost, we care about the people we serve. And that's, it's been a hallmark of my service for the last 15 years, and I plan on making a hallmark over the X number of years that I continue to serve as mayor. It starts with how you answer the telephone. Um, too often times that I have not heard in the first 28 days, so I won't throw anybody under the bus. But I have heard things before when you answer the phone and someone says, what do you want? To me, that's absolutely unacceptable. It should be unacceptable to everybody. Businesses don't survive that way, neither will, neither will we. We need to start with, how, we, how can we help you? Either we can or we can't, but it has to start that way. I'm impressed every single day by the hundreds of dedicated city employees who already exhibit this excellence in customer service. Uh, but I've noticed a few silos, and I've highlighted some silos over the last couple of weeks. And as my good friend Don Rice says, um, when you go to preserve the status quo, that that's unacceptable to me too. I, I can't live the next you know, four, eight, 12, 20 years, however, however fortunate I am to be able to have this job and protect the status quo. Um, I said oftentimes that I think people need to be uncomfortable in their seats, but I regard that as a positive thing. I don't mean it in a bad way, but you need to regard that as positive change. We all need to rethink our role and how you interact with us and how we, react, how we interact with you also. A thriving Akron is not only good for the region, it's great for the region. People who live in our neighboring communities, they rely on the city for employment, public services, arts, culture, college education, and much, much more. Without a flourishing and a prosperous urban core, our region will be unable to compete with the metropolitan areas around, Ohio, around the country and quite frankly, around the world. So we must seek unprecedented partnerships with surrounding communities to build networks that I think will support new jobs in Akron and the region. That's why my first week in office, when the news of Macy's came down, the first, one of the first phone calls I made was to Chicago Falls Mayor John Walters and Town Mayor Dave Klein um, to see if we can get together to kind of work together to protect, uh, we want to protect the investment that's been made in the Chapel Hill area, whether we service, uh, like I said, the departure of Macy's and Old Navy um, uh, announced this month. It's disappointing, and to all of us it is, but it's not fatal either. We have to look at these as opportunities. If we can remake or repurpose the mall area for a desirable place for residents and businesses, we can save the investment that all three communities have made in that area for quite some time. In recent speeches to the community, uh, First Energy CEO Chuck Jones, Gojo Chairman Joe Camper, President Scott Scarborough, uh, hospital leaders Tim Stover, Bill Considine, and Tom Malone have all commented on the one thing they see in the greater Akron community, and that's the tremendous strengths we have here compared to other metropolitan areas. Well, I want to echo and thank them and echo their, cement, their comments also. I see those same, those same strengths every single day. Our unemployment rate has been, uh, in the community has not been this low in 10 years. Our overall employment rate hasn't been this high in the Akron region since the recession of 2008. More than 150 Fortune 500 companies have facilities in Greater Akron, and we are headquarters for two Fortune 200 companies, Goodyear and First Energy. Akron also enjoys an, intera uh, excuse me, an international reputation in racing circuits around the world. NASCAR tires are made at Goodyear, and the Indy, tire, Indy tires are made at Bridgestone Technical Center right here in Akron. The world's best known gravity event is uh, Derby Downs. Professional golf, any of you know me, professional golf, long a favorite of mine, um, has enjoyed a 60-year run in, in the city of Akron uh, based on and because of the support of an army of volunteers. We have one of the top 50 marathons uh, in the United States. And another Akron invention that is important to millions of people who attend an AA meeting every week, 
the, Al the Alcoholics Anonymous movement began at the Gate Lodge, as many of you know, in 1935. And today, like every day, uh, people around the world will use a billion squirts of Purell hand sanitizer invented right here in Africa. And those are some of the success stories I think that we can go right into. Of all the elements that speak to our quality of life, um, including the national park, uh, our metro parks, none is more important or remarkable than the high quality of health care that we enjoy in the region. From Zuma Health, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Akron General, and Akron Children's Hospital, three leading institutions when it comes to health care, not only in, in this area, but I would say around the country. And as we recognize, and I would say unique traits for a community our size, it's important that we acknowledge reality. Uh, there are neighborhoods within Akron that are not and have not seen growth nor prosperity in years, if not decades. And it's an inequality gap uh, that our country has grown to very troubling levels. And cities all over the country, including Akron, are bearing the brunt of its impact. And in speaking to other mayors, they're bearing the same sort of impact we are. It was an issue 10 or 15 years ago that we did not have to deal with. Well, guess what? It's front and center now, and we will have to deal with it. And as I list all of our successes, it makes the contrast even more striking to know that two Akron zip codes, which has been highlighted over the last few months, have the worst infant mortality rates in the county and among, among the worst in the state of Ohio. Um, it's important because as the Summit County Health Department is new, Fortune 500 companies look at infant mortality rates as a marker of the community's overall well-being. It's unconscionable to me, and it should be unconscionable to every single one of us here, that this day and age, with the advances in medicine, with the embarrassment of riches that we have in healthcare locally, that in certain African-American neighborhoods, that the African rate of infant mortality is no better than it was 100 years ago. That's an unconscionable fact. <laughs> Furthermore, we know that our infant mortality rates are impacted by much more, like social determinants to health, transportation, housing, education, access to quality health care, and that's just to name a few. And these factors have also affected some of the other health disparities facing Akronites today. And that includes, uh, those would include our uh, obesity and uh, diabetes rates, access to behavioral health services, and much more. Uh, my colleague Russ Fry and Donald Skoda have done a fantastic job of addressing some of these issues without uh, a boost from the city itself. So today I'm committing to them and, and to everybody here that over the next four years, this situation will not be tolerated. In the coming months, I'm going to I am going to convene a health equity summit for leaders of our health and social service agencies, our faith community, our educators, and our residents to find out what needs to be done to address these issues. The data is out there. It's just a matter of going to attack the problem. We have to be able to improve the overall well-being and health for all of us. If we don't have enough funding for maternal health, I'm going to go find it. If we don't have enough engagement with our neighborhoods and with our, and with our strategic partners, we're going to form new partnerships that can support it. It's, one of the, it's a highlight for this administration over the next four years. And I've asked my assistant for health education and families, Dr. Terry Alderman, to lead this uh, on behalf of the city, knowing that the Summit County Executive and the Summit County Public Health Department stand behind us for what we believe and we address is the intolerable existence of inequity in our city. <laughs> Despite some of these setbacks, um, and there have been a few, let me tell you why, as a lifelong resident of uh, this community, I'm also very optimistic about our future. I'm going to infuse into every one of our neighborhoods uh, the same commitment with which we've approached the planning and development of downtown over the last decade. Uh, if you've not been online to read a blog called Notes from the Underground, then I recommend you Google it as Google now become a verb. Um, read, the remarkable, read the remarkable research that Jason Segedy has been doing on all of our neighborhoods. I always mispronounce his name, so I want to make sure I got it right this time. He's been doing a lot of research on our neighborhoods uh, for about a year or so. In fact, he gave me a map the other day that showed this is the condition of our housing. You know, we've built more houses in this city from 1930 to 1942 over the, than, than the last 15 years. We built more houses during the Great Depression than we did in the last 15 years. To me, it's another one of those things that, you know, if we, if we can't build the housing that people need, they are going to build somewhere else. And it's a prime task for him to be able to um, work out those plans. 
It's also one of the main reasons why I appointed him as Akron's Director of Urban and Planning Development. There are few people in the state of Ohio who have the focus that Jason does on preserving what is best about our legacy neighborhood and developing the urban core. It truly has a, a, a very 30,000 foot vision of how that can happen. And one of my proudest achievements as a councilman was to lead the improvements in Highland Square. If you've not been back there, and I know I've talked about this for months, uh, that process began about 15 years ago. And although it took some time to get done, um, that's the same vibrancy that I want to see in every one of our neighborhood business districts. It includes a library, it includes a community center, and it also includes a new grocery store. And those are the things that can add to the quality of life to a neighborhood. And each one of these neighborhoods may be different, but we need to get in there and assess them. And I know Jason's eager to get in there and do that in each one of them. I know we can expand that particular model to every one of the neighborhoods, whether it be Temple Square, or Copley Road, Goodyear Boulevard, Firestone Park, Ellen, and Kenmore. There are amazing individuals who are leading change within our community, not necessarily waiting for the city or for anybody else. And I've witnessed that strength uh, of the people of Akron, whether it's people cheering on uh, strangers and friends during the Akron Marathon, groups of young professionals who are uh, literally energetically claiming the city as their own neighborhood. Leaders who have created the Better Blocks on North Hill, Porch Rocker Festival, which was excellent, by the way, and the annual festival in uh, Ellet and Kenmore. We have a city filled with brilliant minds and a really a community-driven spirit. And I think that harkens back to what um, the hospital leaders and Joe Camper and uh, Chuck Jones said. It's that community-driven spirit that really separates us from a lot of metropolitan areas. And I'd like to recognize one of them today who should and who has inspired me to quite literally get their hands a little bit more dirty in community work. Karen Edwards lives in a house behind the fire station on Maple Street overlooking Glendale Cemetery. Come up the back side you see off again. Uh, with the help of uh, Councilman Rich Swirsky, uh, some friends and community supporters, she led an effort to clean up the Glendale steps, which had long been neglected. In other parts of West Akron, she has planted community gardens, including the one at John Brown House that is maintained by the residents of Saperstein Town. But this past summer, on her own, with little help from the city, she created a whole program called City Sprouts for kids who go to Mason Park and the Lawton Street Community Centers in the summer. Over 10 weeks, she helps kids develop an appreciation of nature, gives them tools for making healthier eating choices, which is one of those keys to the social determinants of health. They plant flowers, they plant berries, vegetables, herbs, and they learn how to live a healthier lifestyle. And that's really the key to all this, is that we have to get the kids earlier when they make some of those uh, lifestyle choices. The kids start their day by picking up litter in the park. They eat a lunch provided at our recreation center, for which, for many, may be the best meal of the day. But Karen also creates a garden space where kids, from living situations we cannot imagine, find peace. One day this past July, one of Karen's City Sprouts girls um, had witnessed a 17-year-old boy uh, shot by gunfire the night before. She came to the garden at Mason Park that day, angry and sad about what had happened. She asked Karen to help her clean up the blood in front of her, uh, in front of her house. All of the kids eventually gathered in the community garden where they could talk about the young man who was shot and, and maybe about what his family was feeling. Karen read to them from the book, The Forgiveness Garden, about two villages who were at war with each other and how the children came, to the, how the children came together from the village to create a garden where the adults could resolve conflict. Think about that. Kids prompting adults to resolve their conflict. So let that sink in for a second. This summer, with the support of the LeBron James Family Foundation, Karen hopes to plant a forgiveness garden at Mason Park. Karen, can I ask you to stand, please, and be recognized. <laughs> And I, I wonder how many of you people, and you can do a cursory raise your hands, how many people have, how many people here knew about Karen's work uh, and have seen her Facebook page? That's not enough. She should have, you know, 10,000 likes on Facebook. She's got a Twitter handle, and I probably just mispronounced that whole thing. She's got that, she should have millions of followers. All right, show my page. The, the page is called City Sprouts, and I encourage you to go look at it. Karen is an example, and her faith in the city inspires me, quite frankly, should inspire all of you, to build a city government that is innovative, effective, and efficient at the same time. But we need to tell more of these stories. Uh, I guarantee there are more of these stories out there. To attack the negativity, I think, sometimes creeps in and often arises in some of our neighborhoods. 
We need to do a better job of sharing our accomplishments, period. And you need to let us help you share those accomplishments on every media platform and even through that new thing called social media. I want to hear from you. Tweet your best ideas to me using the hashtag, we're gonna get up there, hey actor, and eventually you get up there. And I'll get it, I'll answer these questions. We have not communicated, I think, as a city very well in the years. We need to communicate better. We need to, we need to take those ideas a little bit better also. And I need you to challenge us on every single day. You tell us about the good things that are going on in your community. Tell us how we can improve. Sometimes don't expect the same, the same response today in the past. You will get a response. We will respond. It might not be the answer that you always like, but you will get a response. And I need to be able to measure our successes too. So when I give my first community report a year from now, by the way, this just doubles the state of the city address. <laughs> I can share with you the real progress that we will make together. And if we can harness our collective imaginations, I know we can build a better act. One that is bigger, one that is better, and one that is stronger. Thank you very much. Enjoy the moment. Mayor Horgan has graciously agreed to respond to questions submitted by our audience. You may still send questions via your mobile devices using the Quail technology, and those instructions for using Quail can be found in the brochures at your table. You may also submit written questions using the note cards provided in each of your tables. So please raise your cards to be collected, and I'm going to ask Karen Lefton, Akron Roundtable board member, and principal attorney of the Lefton Group LLC, who will present the questions to the mayor for you. Thank you, Steve. I'm delighted to be here to present the questions to our very smart mayor, who used up all our lunch time on his address, so that we're going to have a few fewer questions. But you have a lot of good ones, so I'm going to get to them really rapidly. First, um, much of the audience is interested in knowing this afternoon council will be meeting, and there's been some discussion about raises for your cabinet. Just um, appointed a month ago, and their salaries were set, and now you're asking for 3% raises for them retroactive to January. Can you explain to the audience members why the cabinet is um, deserving of raises at this stage? Yes, um, to the, uh, the contract, the way it was negotiated was over multiple administrations. Um, it was negotiated in good faith um, between all four of the bargaining units to be able to do that. Um, what I wanted to do was kind of remove myself. Um, I, I, I don't believe in separating out, um, you know, the management staff um, as opposed to non-bargaining and bargaining. So I, I left them in to be able to do that. I understand the concern about it, um, but it was a conscious choice to be able to do it. You talked a little bit about the uh, impact of Huntington and uh, First Merit, and I know we all read that the Huntington executives came to see you after the announcement was made. And the question from the audience is, what did they promise you, and what did you get from them? Uh, the, I, Russ Pry, a county executive, and I met with him, and I can tell you, you know, Russ Pry is a true friend of the city of Akron. I mean, almost everything that he does um, was, is with that benefit in mind, and that I appreciate um, all of that. tires, so to speak. Um, to me, the, the, the deal still has to be done. Um, we stressed quite a few things. Was the um, long-standing roots that First Merit had in helping with the bonding issues and the development issues that the city has, along with a lot of other community partners, but also uh, the strong presence they have and the job level. And, and quite frankly, they said, um, I mean, they said, you know, we want to, we want to, we want to earn that, we want to earn the same level of trust that First Merit has had over the years and, and we'll continue to try and help them do that. I want businesses to grow, so if there's a particular business strategy that they have that we can help augment, we want to do that with everybody. So it wasn't anything necessarily promised because really nothing's been approved yet either. I mean, there's still some details to be worked out. Earlier in the month, we read about your plan, your goal to uh, increase Akron's population by 25%, I believe, from uh, under 200,000 to 250,000. And the um, audience wants to know 
what three concrete steps are on the drawing board to turn that goal into an achievement? Housing, jobs, health care. <laughs> we, need, we need better housing, we need more jobs, and we need better health care. I, I know we have good health care in the community, but that needs to extend to all. I think all of those things help the city grow um, to its level. And I'm not sure if you put that 25% out there. I'm going to have to talk to Jason. No, I, listen, I am open for city growth. And quite frankly, I think we are over $200,000. One of those numbers that I think we want to continue to grow. Okay. So if I can just expand, expand on that, too. Um, you say housing. And you talked a little bit in your speech about more places for young people to live downtown. Right. What concrete ideas do you have to have that housing become a reality? Well, there's a strong demand for it. So it's meeting that, it's meeting that demand, and I've already had multiple conversations with developers who are going to meet that demand downtown, but I just don't want to do things scattershot. And so I put a building here, put a building there. There needs to be an overall strategic plan. So one of the first concrete steps that I did was in January was to put a, was to put a team together so they can start looking at a strategic plan. I think I mentioned Susie to be able to help lead that with our planning department and with input from council, the community, everybody, and have a strategic plan of where things should go. Housing, the amenities, the parking, all of those things. Now it includes a new 50 or some odd acres. I'd have to get the exact amount from the end. The huge amount that may become available with the interval. That, that, that floods in there and that changes the whole equation. So it's having a plan to be able to do that. That brings us to a question along the same line uh, from a person in the audience who says that it's evident throughout the downtown area that there are so many abandoned storefronts and buildings. What specifically do you have in mind to, to change those? Well, we act, the ones that we own, we actively market almost every single day. We can talk to our economic development team, um, and there are plans and proposals on, on some of those vacant storefronts, and we are actively marketing almost everything else that we own or that we can start to develop. There are people in the audience who are interested in knowing how they can get more involved in helping with the ideas for the interbelt development and the downtown development. So what specifically are you looking for from the people in the I, audience? I, you know what, if, you, if, if you're going to use social media, if you want to tweet your ideas or your name and contact to hashtag A Akron, we'll get it. Um, if not, contact the mayor's office. We have um, multiple ways to get a hold of us, whether it's sending us an email, whether it's a phone call, all of those different things. Or if you want to drop a business card, up, I'll be here for a couple minutes after. So there's room for everybody and all your good ideas. For anybody who is interested in food trucks, here's another one that the, the audience is very interested in. What do you see the future of food trucks being in the city of Akron? Jeff? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the, my experience with food trucks has been good. I understand the argument about the, you know, the, the concrete and mortar investments into some of these. Um, we haven't gotten too much into it, I guess, in the first 28 days to be able to do it. Like I said, I don't think I think they do add some vibrancy. Where they are and how they compete, I think those are still be determined. You mentioned during your speech that um, the status quo is no longer going to be acceptable. So the real question that the audience has is the status quo, what we used to be known as the River City. Mm -hmm. What do you want it to be known as in the 21st century? That's a good question. Don't have a tagline, but I like the rubber city, I and mean, it reflects back on our strong history. And rubber just doesn't mean rubber; it's polymers, it's high tech. That's those are all very um, advanced um, procedures to be able to make those products. So as we evolve from that particular tagline, we you know just include more of the tech part of it because I think I think that's one of the uh, drivers of new economies, and if I can, the new drivers, um, sector drivers of our economy. Um, polymers is definitely one. And for years, the city has partnered with the Akron Community Foundation to fund matching grants via the Neighborhood Partnership Program. How do you plan to use such funding to empower neighborhoods? I know a lot of those questions come from city council as they do those, so we'll continue to partner with the Akron Community Foundation to do as much. If we can do more, I'll try and do more. So that process will, will remain the same. Okay, we're getting close to our time now. but. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up with, you know, before you were inaugurated, you had a nice story where you talked about your goals for the city of Akron, and one thing you were concerned about is day one, um, no surprises. So the question from the audience is, what were the three biggest surprises when you walked in day one? Really? <laughs> um, 
tough question. It's open-ended one. Uh, I, I don't know if I was surprised so much, um, but it's just, you know, it's just the newness of, you know, there's new people that I'm working with, new people that you go to work with every day. And quite frankly, that's been the exciting part, is the people that you get to work with every day, and how dedicated they are. It wasn't a surprise, it was just a re reaffirmation of my faith that I think uh, of all the 1,800 people that work for the city, they're out there every day doing, that doesn't surprise me. And I've, I've been along the way, I went down to the Snow Center early on. I stopped by a, a couple of city workers trimming a tree just to say hi. That was one of the things I think I'm maybe surprising them more than me. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be surprised by the snowstorm and not, I hope I just didn't jinx ourselves because I did get out of CDC a day early. And that's been a, that's been a, you know, that's been a welcome thing for us to, we plan, they plan for that snow the day after the last flight flies. And so to not have to expend those resources is a very pleasant um, accomplishment so far. So, but I can't take credit, that's Mother Nature. Well, I would take credit for it because you can never tell when you get the blame for it. And I'll get the blame. I mean, we get the blame, trust me. And the final thing is, um, you mentioned the task force that you appointed because you wanted to look under the hood. The question is, the hood you're looking under, is it a Chevy or a Cadillac? It's always been a Cadillac. Mayor, thank you for being with us today. On behalf of Akron Roundtable, it's my pleasure to present you with a contemplative sun as a memento of your time with us this afternoon. Celebratory work of art was designed exclusively for the round table by local Akron artist and craftsman Don Drum. We look forward to you joining us at the Quaker Station on the University of Akron campus in downtown Akron on Thursday, February the 18th, when the Akron Roundtable will host professional golfer and educator Renee Powell, one of only three African American women to ever play on the LPGA Tour and head professional golfer at Clearview Golf Course in East Canton. We also ask that you save the date of October the 3rd to join in a gala celebration of Akron Roundtable's 40th anniversary to be held here at the Knight Center. Our special guest for that event will be Patrick Carney of the Black Keys, who will be interviewed by award-winning author and journalist and Patrick's high school friend, David Gipples. Thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Akron Roundtable.